What's going on, y'all? Welcome back to another episode. And I told y'all we have a special treat coming up for you today. My dog, one of the absolute best basketball YouTubers on the net, who venue is in the house. Bro, what's going on today? Hey, I'm, I'm chilling, man. I appreciate you having me on, bro. I'm excited to no, talk. No, nah, I bet, you. bro. We uh we we first started started connecting a couple months ago, but we did that uh we did that that chat on uh on Twitter together and I got a chance to kind of hear some of your takes and everything about the LA Lakers and what's going around the NBA I remember we had a heated discussion about Rudy Gobert and the Utah Jazz and stuff man so you know you're super knowledgeable y'all if, if you don't know who Hoop is I 1000% tell you go subscribe go like the videos go share it's one of the best you know there's only certain people that I really listen to and so every time Hoop drop a video man I'm, I'm, I'm the first thing on I got my notifications turned on and I love the stuff you do the breakdowns that you do uh my favorite video you've ever done if I had to say not being biased with the Nikola Jokic video it might have been that Steph Curry video you did about 11 months ago bro that was asinine bro I mean it was it was elite bro so super super thankful for you man I'm, I'm really glad we got a chance to do this together yeah I appreciate you bro appreciate you uh supporting the content man I'm just I'm just out here trying to Share my opinions. I'm just, you know, I'm yeah, just yeah, trying yeah, to get my, get my word out there. Yeah, no bet, bro. So, y'all, this is going to be a great day today, man. We're going to have a lively, lively discussion. We got a couple great topics we're going to talk through today. Now, we got two different segments. The first segment we're going to talk about is if you could take a player and build a championship team around that player, who would your five players be and then who your dark horse is? So, five players, we're going to tell you, this is who we want to build an NBA championship around with the best roster possible, but then also a dark horse, somebody you wouldn't even think about. And then the next thing is, is who's up next? Who's on the come up? We're going to talk about the players. Again, five that's ready to explode, that's ready to maybe take that all-star leap, all-NBA leap, or maybe they've been on the bench, and now they're going to come and go be a starter or whatever else. So we're going to find that out, plus another dark horse, man. So this content is about to be fire. So you know what? I'm going to go ahead and let you get started. All right, so you got your, your first pick. If you could say this is the player that I would like to build a championship roster around, who would that first player be for you and why? I think uh, anyone who knows me knows who I'm going to choose. It's Steph Curry. Steph Curry is that guy, man. <laughs> if I'm building around anyone in the league, it's Steph Curry. I, I feel like, um, for one, if you're looking at a high-end situation, this is a guy who can play off the ball. He's, he's the best floor spacer we've ever seen. It's a guy who's not going to take anything away from any other player without the ball in his hands. And when you put the ball in his hands, he can serve as, as a traditional pick and roll scorer. He can score in isolation. He, he can, he just creates mismatches with the defense that allows guys like Draymond Green playmaking bigs to, to exploit. And of course, like the unique gravity, we all know he, he's drawing extra defenders 30 feet out off the ball, which mm -hmm. we've never seen. We've never seen before. And I feel like he just opens up the floor so much for, for any opportunity Anything can work. He can fit into any system. And I feel like just having a guy like that who can who can floor raise, we saw him this year, floor raise teams with weak spacing and, and take them to great heights. That last stretch of the season, the last 30 games, they played at a near 60 win pace. And I feel like, and then you put him in high end situations like we saw him next to Clay, Draymond, KD. Mm -hmm. Nothing gets taken away from his game and he's not taking away anything from anyone else's game. Mm -hmm. So I feel like a guy like Steph Curry, I feel like that's got to be my number one pick. Look, now let me tell you, man. So Steph Curry in that month of April, you all, I don't know if y'all forgot. He was averaging 36 points per game in the month of April last year on stupid efficiency, dumb efficiency. Now I remember this is the same game that Jamal Murray got hurt. So this is a sour place for folks that are Jamal Murray fans, but I want to say he might've dropped 57 points or something like that. And again, man, remember that game. the thing I love about Steph Curry is Steph Curry Reminds me of uh, what Rip Hamilton could have been had he been that kind of floor spacer. Because you remember Rip back in the day when he played for Detroit. Amazing. Running the baseline. That's all he would do. He would run the baseline the whole game. He was the most conditioned athlete in basketball at that point in time. And you know what's funny? MPJ actually went out and worked out with Steph Curry for a whole week this summer. And one of the first things he said is Steph conditioning is like out of this world. Because, again, you think about it, like, somebody that's that great off ball who needs literally half a second to get a shot off, if not less, man, like, when you got somebody like that, six foot three, crazy ball handling, quick twitch, can get anywhere on the floor past half court, who another threat, yo, I like that a lot. So, I guess for you, like, 
what what do you think are the kind of athletes or kind of players that you need to surround him with now let's even say like you know KD obviously leaving out of it but now where they are currently do you feel like this Warriors roster with Wiseman with Draymond with hopefully a potential play coming back with Jordan Poole coming through with Andrew Wiggins do you feel like that's kind of the roster that can get him back to the championship I feel like this Warriors team has the has the formula but I, it almost feels like they're just lacking the talent level to mm. compete with teams like the Nets, the Lakers, the Nuggets. Like mm-hmm. these, it's just a talent thing. I feel like they have the formula, they have they have the roster. It's just about getting that talent, squeezing as much talent out of out of those guys as you can. Yeah. And I feel like uh, if they can do that successfully, I have no problem with saying they can come out of the West. Definitely. Yeah. Fact. I agree with that. I agree with that. All right. So if I had to pick the first player for me. And we're just starting off from bank. Look, man, I, I've been a Giannis Antetokounmpo fan for a long time now. I, I can't say I've ever seen a six foot 11 super freak athlete with that kind of work ethic. Now, again, you know, I don't know if you saw the preseason game the other day when he came down and he had like 10 jump shots and his mm-hmm. form completely changed up. He got rid of that little pause and that hitch. Now it's much more fluid, dangerous. But Giannis Antetokounmpo for me is such a a unique player because he's so unselfish, yet he's so dominant, and you want him to have the ball in his hands as much as possible. I mean, his inside game, we're talking about numbers and efficiency that we haven't seen since Shaquille O'Neal. For me, I would love for – here's the thing. I think the Bucs have a really good roster around Giannis. I think that Chris Middleton is a good number two for him. I think Drew Holiday being a great perimeter defender for him, surrounding him with P.J. Tucker – I think they have the ideal roster around him. Plus, when you have, like, Brent, Brent Forbes, and then you get some other people in there. I think they got Doug McDermott and everything as well. So, like, they got some shooters, man. Like, with him, my biggest thing is just I want to make sure that court is spaced out as much as possible. And really, ideally, man, not in the full game, but late-game situations, I would love to see Giannis Antetokounmpo at the five. Mm-hmm. Playing the center in the finals or in the playoffs at the end of the game, and you got Chris – Drew Forbes, and then you get Doug McDermott on the outside, or even PJ Tucker and his patented corner three point shooter. Man, I love Giannis Antetokounmpo. Yeah, I love Giannis. I mean, I'm glad that they finally started taking him off the ball more this year. I think he's at his best when he's used like that because he's an mm-hmm. athletic freak. He can go up and get the ball in any lob. He's an above the rim threat. Mm-hmm. Um, for the first time this year, I think we saw him actually uh, flashing to the ball more and battling for positioning down low. Very mm-hmm. reminiscent of Shaq, which mm-hmm. obviously we all know Shaq is the most dominant paint force we've ever seen. So I feel like when you have a guy like Giannis, who's who's more engaged off the ball, uh, when you have other guys who can create their own shot, like Drew Holiday, Chris Middleton, mm-hmm. that they have the right roster for him to max get the most out of his game. And obviously in transition, he's unstoppable. That's mm-hmm. where he's on, that's where he's best with the ball in his hands, running the floor. He's a great decision maker going downhill. And I feel like when you have guys like that who can space the floor, take him off the ball, but allow him to still run as a transition engine, I feel like the Bucs do have the best possible roster fit-wise for Giannis. I definitely think so. So this question for you, bro. So people have been making that argument between him and Anthony Davis for probably three years now, really since Giannis made an MVP leap. uh, Then Anthony Davis was still considered a top 10 player, especially that last year with New Orleans. What do you think the biggest difference is between like their games? Is it like a skill set? Is it a mindset? Like why hasn't Anthony Davis taken that leap that Giannis has? For me, AD is a phenomenal off ball player and he's obviously a better shooter spacer than Giannis. I think they're similar on the defensive end. I think the big difference in their game comes from the ability to create on the ball. I think Giannis is just leaps better as an on-ball creator, opening up opportunities for teammates. Where AD, we've seen he can make cross-court passes. Um, You're not going to see him really taking the ball up and really initiating sets. He's not going to really try and get in and collapse the defense and kick out to a shooter, things like Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a situation where Giannis is working with worse spacing, that probably does look a little bit worse. But we've seen him do it uh, in the playoffs, in the regular season, in the finals where he's actively creating open shots for teammates at a level that we've just haven't seen AD do. And that's my, that's where where I see the biggest difference in their games. Yeah. I agree with that. All right. So player number two for you that you would build a championship contender around. So we've talked about Curry and Giannis that leaves a, leaves a few guys. I think I'm going to go with, 
it's tough for me because I feel like there's, there's guys I want to build around. Mm -hmm. If I'm building around a guy, I'm going to say LeBron James is my next guy. I'm going to say LeBron James. Okay. Age 36, Um, LeBron James. LeBron James. I just feel like the formula for him has worked so well where you just give him a strong pick and roll big, Mm. some spacing. You're one of the best teams in the league. I feel like we've just seen it work so many times. If he's not the same after injury, I would definitely change this pick. Yeah. But like looking at it from the perspective of LeBron before the ankle injury, I feel like we saw what he could do. Mm. Um, The Lakers were looking phenomenal on both ends of the floor. They had like a top offense and the number one defense in the league. And I feel like LeBron, he's still adding value defensively. He's so smart with his rotations. He's still adding weak side rim protection and things like that. And offensively, I mean, there's nobody in NBA history that I want the the ball in their hands more than LeBron James. Just mm-hmm. the overall decision making, just what he can do, the way he can floor raise role players into looking like legitimate stars for stretches, while also not really taking away anything from off ball bigs like Anthony Davis. Mm-hmm. I feel like, uh, yeah, I feel like if I'm building around someone. I feel like LeBron James, just the formula in place we've seen, it's it's successful. It's just, it works. Yeah, you know what's funny? He's the first player, I think, in my, that I can think of, you know, you might know better than me. When I'm thinking of like a, a wing player, like a dominant wing, top tier player who really started to build in that idea of having the stretch four as the five on the court that you can pick and roll with, but also that can do that pop out. And I really think, again, Chris Bosh set that mold for what we're always looking for today. Again, Kevin Love was great at that pop and shoot, but Kevin Love was never the defender that Chris Bosh was. And I think Chris Bosh being that kind of a player, being the opportunity to say like, you know, we need 16 and nine from you shooting 38% from the three pointer hitting about 46% of your mid range shots that changes the game so much for Braun. And so I love the way he plays. I said this the other day, I can't think of, many people that have come into the NBA ready to compete at an elite level on both offense and defense outside of LeBron James. Could you remember them first few years he came into the league, 25 and five, then he eventually got all the way to 31 points per game. I mean, he is absolutely one of the greatest two, three players of all time, considering whoever you might be, however you might believe his status is. And I think for Braun, man, if you give him shooters, you give him perimeter defenders, bro, think about it. He even turned J.R. Smith into a 3 and D guy later in his career. And J.R. wasn't known as a defensive player when he was with New York or even when he was with Denver or New Orleans before that. So just to, to know that his, his center, his aura, his ability to lead a team, it makes everyone else around them rise to the occasion. It got Anthony Davis shooting 48% from the mid range for the first time in his career in the bubble. You know what I mean? Like LeBron just has more effect on the court. I think there's only two players. I think if I'm thinking about that, have that level of effect and I'll talk about him next, but I don't know anyone else who's controls the game possession by possession. Like LeBron James does. Definitely. And he controls the pace so well, like he can, he can gun it. He can, he can lead a number one transition offense without question. Uh, He can gun it off the rebound. He's going to give you like eight, nine rebounds a game. And on all of those rebounds, he, he can explode. And, and he's probably the biggest transition threat we've ever seen. Yeah. But on the same, same, on the other side, with all these transition engines, you don't really see that ability to slow it down, yeah. play a slow paced game. And LeBron James does that just as well. Yeah. And I feel like that's just a trait that people kind of overlook when evaluating him that mm-hmm. like just the ability to play any speed and just control the game so well, it's just, phenomenal my favorite LeBron image and like just me when I think about him 2018 finals where he's on the right block he got Iguodala on his left shoulder and then he is literally it's four spaced out shooters around around the three-point line and it's literally almost every one of the Warriors got a foot in the box because Mm -hmm. that's how dominant he is you know what I mean he's not even doing nothing but it's just the threat of the passing, the threat of the cutting, the threat of getting to the basket, the step backs, the mid-range. So, yeah, he would absolutely be one of them players I would love to build around, even at age 36. Again, really, I don't need LeBron this year to play around 65 to 72 games. I don't need him to play 82 games anymore. You know, let his right. body be fresh for the playoffs. So you already know where I'm going with this. You, you already yeah. know. You brought him up. I think that if I could build an ideal team around – the current best player in the NBA, I don't care what you're talking about. The current best player in the NBA, all right, I'll just play Either Kevin Durant or him right now. That's, that's, that's where I've been this whole offseason. Nikola Jokic is the most unique player that I have ever seen in my life. 
And I think that if you were to build a team around Yoke, I think having Jamal Murray, having MPJ, having Aaron Gordon, I think if I had to say a core four, that's a perfect core four for me. But I've always wanted him to have one of those Matisse Thibels at the perimeter at the two guard. I think if you gave him Matisse Thibel, and this is what I think will, will change people's perspective on Yoke. Yoke is already the most dominant offensive big we've ever seen, the best passer in the NBA currently, probably one of the maybe five or six best passers in NBA history already just through age 26. But I think that if you gave him somebody like Matisse Thibel, I think that would help unlock him defensively in ways that has unlocked Joel Embiid. Now he's Joel Embiid's always going to be a better interior defender than Yoke because of his body, his athleticism, how big he is. But Joel Embiid has helped tremendously by having Ben Simmons, Danny Green, and Matisse Thibel just keeping perimeter guards from getting into the court. And so I think if you give him Matisse Thibel and then you give him an opportunity to have him sticking on Chris Paul or Devin Booker or Steph Curry or Damian Lillard, controlling that pick and roll option, letting him use his hands and his feet, and then having offensively Aaron Gordon, having Michael Porter Jr. who can take, we'll talk about him later as well, taking a leap. Jamal Murray, who's shown that in the playoffs that he's one of the maybe the best five or six players perimeter players in the playoffs when time comes I think for me giving him the core four plus like a Matisse Thibel would probably change the game for me I feel like Jokic yeah he's at his best when he just has athletic off-ball players moving around him in the post but he's also not a traditional heliocentric guy because he's just as good off the ball yeah and it's like I feel like you have someone who can create on the ball, create their own shot and create for others like Jamal Murray. Yeah. And, and you use Jokic as a pick and pop guy, as a two man guy, making quick flicking passes and things like that. And when you have a guy like Aaron Gordon, who who can also space the floor vertically, I feel like that's an underrated trait that no one talks about with Aaron Gordon. It's his ability to get up and, and catch it above the rim as a vertical spacer. I feel like using Jokic as like a short roll guy on the move, Again, so lethal because he's one of the quickest decision makers we've ever seen. And I feel like also his ability to space the floor because of how dominant he is down low, you can't run smaller players on him. You have to run your center on him. Mm -hmm. And I feel like Jokic pulling the center out of the paint. People don't talk about that. And that adds so much value as a playmaker because now those athletic cutters don't have a last line of defense to worry about. Mm -hmm. So a guy like MPJ is perfect for him, an off-ball scoring superstar. And I feel like, yeah, they, they have the formula in place. I would like to see more. Um, Aaron, I would like to see more out of Aaron Gordon defensively. I feel like he can be a bit better um, as a weak side covering guy yeah. uh, in the pick and roll and force teams to, to die by the three pointer a bit more. Mm-hmm. But besides that, they definitely have the roots. It's just about developing those guys. And I think, yeah, I think they're going to be a contender for a long time. And I think yeah. Jokic. They have the right formula to build around Jokic. I would love to build around Jokic. It's so easy to build around Jokic. Mm-hmm. And, uh, yeah, he's if you have Jokic on, a, on your roster, you're going to be a top 10 offense. I don't care who is on the court with him. Mm-hmm. You're going to be a top offense. Yeah. You know, it's funny, like, you know, there, there's been criticisms that I've had. Of, uh, well, let me say, Tim Connolly is one of the best roster builders in the NBA. So, like, again, I'm not, you know, this isn't a criticism decision-making. I think because he is so great, that the Nuggets as an organization are so used to being mediocre that they're now putting an elite roster around him because they have the assets, they have the money, they have the support from the Cronkies. But for me, having Facundo Campazzo, Monte Morris, Austin Rivers, again, these are backup guards, but putting smaller players around him, it works because it's Jokic. But for me, optimizing his talent is putting the biggest and best athletes you can possibly find and surrounding him with those. You know, I've been pushing for Jeff Green for years to come off the bench and be a bad backup wing or a backup four with him. And the reason is, is because if you give him Michael Porter Jr., Jeff Green, Aaron Gordon, and you let them rotate around him, that changes everything defensively, but also offensively. There's so much you can do with that, with having people who can get to the basket, having people who hit shots, mid-range shots. My favorite motion with Yoke is the pick and roll with 5-4 that he has with Aaron Gordon. It's right at the top of the key. Aaron Gordon sets the pick, he rolls to the basket, and it's got MPJ or it's got Jamal Murray in the corner. So either you give up this lob or I'm throwing it to one of these corners, and then you got 40% and a 45% three-point shooter hitting the shot. So I think that's just – it makes Yoke so dangerous 
because there's almost nothing you can do. You can let them, you can solo them if you want. They tried it with Rudy Gobert, and he gave him 47, 10, and five. And so, you know, it, I, he literally may be my favorite player to watch in the NBA right now. But anyway, that's the roster I'll build around. Amar, who, who's next for you? Um, I'm going to go with Kevin Durant. I feel mm. like, uh, I almost feel like I didn't go with Kevin Durant earlier because I think ideally you're kind of building around someone who, who who's more ball dominant and then putting KD next to him, even if he's the best player. Mm. I feel like not t- teams don't have to be built around Kevin Durant for him to be the best player. But I feel like ideally building around Kevin Durant um, has worked many times. All you need is guys who can get him the ball in his spots. You need strong passing. You need – because Kevin Durant isn't going to really do much, like, offensive, like, uh, ball-dominant creating, like a guy like James Harden or Luka. Mm. But when you have someone who can just get him the ball in his spots in the mid post as an off-ball shooter, I feel like just a point guard that can hit him in his spots. And perhaps there's no one better than that or at mm. that than James Harden. So I feel like that's that's a very good duo that people are sleeping on yeah. um, offensively. They 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 complement each other so well. But yeah, just having a guy at running initiating offense that can get the ball to KD, the rest of the roster is going to fill itself out. I Facts. mean, there's no limit to where there's there's no spot where KD is awkward in. That's that's something that's really underrated about him. No matter who you put around him, or or what system he's placed into. He's going to go out there and he's going to get buckets quite simply. Mm-hmm. He's just going to, he's going to do his thing. Mm-hmm. And I feel like uh, building around that, just get him a strong initiator that can get him the ball in his spots, uh, kick off offensive sets. Rest of the roster will fill itself out. I don't want nobody clogging the paint when Kevin Durant has the ball. I don't want no one. I don't want no big. I don't want DeAndre Jordan. I don't want no drumming. I don't want nobody. Cause I don't want any big that's going to make it any difficult for Kevin Durant to do his patented one, two crossover and then get to the bucket. Kevin Durant is one of the best scorers and shooters that I've ever seen, but he's so intelligent on the court. And I think that's what separates him. He literally knows since he was 21 years old, he's been averaging 30 points a game. Like think about that. Like, you know, you're Mm -hmm. 21 and you're putting up 30 and shooting 40% from three. And this was like 2009. You know what I mean? Like he, he's just such a threat, man. And so when I think of Kevin Durant, one thing that's that's always helped Kevin Durant, he's always been represented surrounded by pro, elite point guard play. Remember, he had Russell Westbrook, and then he moved on to Steph Curry, and then now he has James Harden and or Kyrie Irving whenever he does decide to play basketball again. And I think that with Kevin Durant, man, if you give him a perimeter score, that's a great facilitator, and then you give him pieces around him that know where they're supposed to be, that play roles, and really specifically can play defense and let him rest at times, I think that it's, it's, it's probably easier to build a championship contender around Kevin Durant than almost anyone on this side of LeBron James, if we're being completely honest. But it's not like you need greatness at a lot of positions. You just need functional role playing. And then you need good perimeter scoring to take off the, the burden off of him a little bit, take the ball handling burden off of him a little bit. And I think that's probably why they lost to the Milwaukee Bucks in the playoffs. I think had James Harden obviously been healthy, Kevin Durant with the healthy James Harden would have ran through the East as it was, let alone with Kyrie Irving. So I think if you give Kevin an opportunity to get off the ball, to work off those pick and rolls, somebody to give him the ball at that high post, you know, right for that patented one leg fadeaway right off the top of the key. You know what I mean? I think Kevin Durant is just that kind of dude. So it really doesn't take much, man. You just need players that can play defense, know where they're supposed to be, um, but they don't have to be necessarily elite at it they just really need to be good give him an elite playmaker and elite score and then you're kind of out the door right I, I I should have mentioned a bit more the the spacing thing because one of Katie's problems has always been um defenses like committing to him and kind of uh not reacting in the best way and I feel like a lot of that was because of the spacing he grew who yeah he came up with in OKC in Golden State it was so much better we mm-hmm. saw him getting the ball and if the defense committed, he just knew where to go with it and what to do with it. And I feel like when you have guys just spacing a floor where he can work in isolation and he can see defenders committing to him, because when you can't see the defense committing to you, it's going to catch you off guard and you're going to mm-hmm. make make a weird decision. Obviously, there's a, there's guys who who that doesn't happen to, mm-hmm. but like with KD, I feel like that's one of his one of his rare flaws 
is just knowing how to react quickly when the defense commits to you when you don't see it coming. Mm -hmm. And I feel like when you have that much spacing, you're always going to see it coming. You're going to, you can see the floor so much better. And I feel like when KD is working with so much space, um, he, he's lethal. He's unstoppable. Yeah. And honestly, that's probably one of the reasons that they dumped DeAndre Jordan and just started Blake Griffin, which again, you know, for, for me schematically, I don't like that fit near as much, but at the end of the day, the reason they did that is because they don't need an elite perimeter or interior defender because Kevin Durant to his credit has become a rather good interior defender himself. Now he's not going to body with you, but he's going to challenge you at the rim. He can get blocked because again, the dude is seven feet tall with a seven, five wingspan. So that by itself changes the dynamic of the floor, especially in weak side rotations where he has gotten just remarkably better at that since his rookie year. Um, so again, man, he has such so many assets to him. I love Kevin Durant's game. Uh, I think for me, if I had to add my third person in there to build a team around Joel Embiid, I mean, Definitely. maybe this is just a center infatuation for me, but I think Embiid is just one of the most remarkable athletes and interior bigs that we've ever had in the NBA. Obviously, the biggest thing for him is health. I think if you give him a team that doesn't have to rely on him on a night-to-night basis, but if you give him 60 to 65 games a year that he can give you, go ahead and be healthy, get ready for the playoffs. Again, he doesn't necessarily need Ben Simmons What he needs is a perimeter playmaker who can take that scoring burden off, who can open the floor up for him, but also run that pick and roll game with him, whether he rolls or he pops. Now, once again, though, that's something that Embiid does that I think is so unique because him as a pick and roll threat, he shot 36% from three point last year. He was at 40 up until really the injury started really taking his legs out from him. But then you get all the way up into the playoffs. When he rolls to the basket, there's almost no one no one in the NBA that can deal with him coming down the lane as a freight train, whether it's Rudy Gobert, whether it's Clint Capella, as we watched in the playoffs when Clint was, was getting worked over because he's just too big. Size-wise, the only player in the NBA that really can deal with him, Andre Drummond, but he can't play defense like that. Nikola Jokic is big enough, but I think they offset each other a little bit because neither one of them can stop each other. Also, by the way, side note, I, I really hope one day we get an NBA Finals matchup between those two. Because, Yo, kitchen and you know what I mean? That would be so much be fun. Because we haven't had a, a playoff matchup like that. You think wait, since, uh, I want to say maybe Duncan and Shaq from like back in the day, you know? But mm-hmm. anyway, so I think a B would be great. I think if you gave him a Jamal Murray, you gave him a De'Aaron Fox, you gave him a Tyrese Halliburton or something like that, or you even gave him a Kyrie Irving, especially. I, I really don't know what you would do, how you would stop that. You know what I mean? Then having Danny Green on the outside, still having Matisse Thybul, still having Tobias Harris, which I don't love next to him. But again, I think that space is the floor. But if you gave him a perimeter playmaker of the Kyrie Irving, of the Jamal Murray, of the, I mean, it doesn't got to be Trey Young, maybe even Colin Sexton, you know, something like that, just to give him opportunity. I think that would open it up. I feel like I'm glad you mentioned Joel Embiid's downhill ability, how he's like unstoppable. And I think it's worth noting, not only is his size making him faster down, going down too, his footwork is phenomenal when he's, when he's slashing, when he's driving like that, he's, he's a, if someone matches his size, he's going to get around them. He's going to, mm-hmm. he's going to Euro around them, whatever it is. He's going to go, go to a classic spin move. Whatever it is, he can get around or through people, and that's what mm-hmm. makes him so unique going downhill. Um, obviously, we've seen on multiple occasions Joel Embiid working in the post is conductive to great offense. It's fun. It's phenomenal how efficient he is with that level of volume in the post. And I feel like when you have a guy like Ben Simmons next to him, the defense can commit to him, and without having to worry about Ben Simmons. So having a guy, like you said, just just someone who can create their own shot, but also is a threat to score outside off the catch, a simple mm-hmm. kick out would work wonders for Philly. And I mm-hmm. think Joel Embiid can definitely be the number one guy on a championship team, no question. So who do you think would be the best fit to him from a guard play of the potential trade options? You know, let's leave Damian Lillard out of it. I think that's pretty obvious. Um, if you could say like a trade, for, I mean, do you look at the Pacers with the Brogdon and Karis avert situation coming over to Philly? I mean, do you see somebody else that might be a better fit? I don't even think it has to be a point guard. I think a guy like Zach Levine or Bradley Beal would be perfect next to next to Joel Embiid because they can create their own shot at the highest level damn near. 
And they don't take anything away from him beating the post because of how good they can work off the ball and shoot the outside shot. So for me, the ideal trade for, for putting next to Embiid would be either Bradley Beal or Zach Levine. Definitely. Well, you know, what's funny. I'm thinking about Zach Levine right now. I think he's only making 19 and a half million dollars right now, which again, maybe would make it the contract situation a little difficult, but bro, like Lonzo ball, Zach Levine, DeMar DeRozan at three years, $85 million a year. I'm not sure how that fit's going to work, especially with Vucevic coming at the center. And then he got, uh, uh, what is it? Uh, Patrick Williams at the four and stuff as well. Hey, maybe that's something that they can explore. You know, maybe we get to mid season if Ben's still playing for the 76ers and the Chicago bulls, they just aren't putting together because of the roster. And maybe they're like, you know what? Zach Levine swap him out with Ben Simmons, having Lonzo Ben Simmons, and then DeMar. Now from a spacing standpoint, this is what people will have to change. And again, I, this is me going off of my uh, 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 Chicago Bulls ran a little bit. Spacing wise, I think it works because Lonzo Ball is a better three point shooter than people realize right now. They don't realize that he actually was a better three point shooter than Trey Young last year. You know, so I think if you give him that with that perimeter defense and sub that out, give Zach Levine to Joel Embiid and then give the Chicago Bulls Ben Simmons, that might be an option. Yeah, definitely. I also think it's worth noting how amazing the Kyle Lowry fit would have been for Philly. Oh, that would have been that would have been amazing for Joel Embiid. Amazing. I, I think, think even that's having that leadership with him that that would have helped out a lot. Definitely, yeah. Just a guy to motivate Embiid because I feel like Embiid a lot of it is him just not being motivated in Philly right now. Yeah, and I feel like having a guy like Lowry who who is a champion, he has the mm-hmm. experience. I think yeah, especially yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think you're gonna. Uh, find a uh, Toronto Ram- Raptors fans going to be following you very heavily after that comment. Uh, all right. So now who would be your fourth option? Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. It, uh, who would be it, your fourth option? For some reason, it like la- did a lag spike, but um, my fourth option, I feel like I want to go down the list a little bit and get unique. I feel like, um, it's possible to build around, like, obviously we have guys like James Harden, Luka Doncic, Anthony Davis, who you can make the case for. I'm going to get a little interesting and say, you can build a championship team around Rudy Gobert. I know that sounds <laughs> crazy. Hear me out. Hear I me knew out. it was coming. I knew it was coming. Hear me out. Okay. I think Gobert, obviously, I think it's, it's he's pretty comfortably the best screen setter in the NBA, I'd say. Um, yeah. He, 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 He's a he's a, a phenomenal pick and roll big. So putting a dominant pick and roll ball handler, um, keep in mind when I'm saying build around Gobert, he doesn't necessarily have to be the best player, but it's built around him. So when you have a dominant pick and roll ball handler, um, say Damian Lillard for example, I feel like uh, you, that's already automatic offense. Just having a high pick and roll guy for Gobert who can pull up on the three, but also because when you have a guy who can pull up, we see it with Donovan Mitchell right now he's drawing doubles on the, on the pick and roll and then corner defenders are forced to help on Gobert in the paint. Uh, roll gravity, I think is a thing that people overlook with him. And then you have open, just open shooters all over the floor. That's why the jazz were such an outlier shooting team. They were, they, they they're, they're collapsing defense from that initial pick and roll every time. And I feel like um having a guy who's a dominant pick and roll ball handler, and then just having athletic shooters that can defend because that was the problem with Gobert in the postseason. They didn't have anyone on the point of attack that was preventing that rim pressure from the Clippers. Gobert is forced to help. It's an open three every play. And I feel like having um, elite point of attack defenders who can also space the floor out of that initial pick and roll, I feel like that's built around Gobert, and I think that's a championship-level formula, personally. Well, look, I I have to say, you know, after watching Donovan Mitchell score 36 points per game in the first round against uh, the Nuggets in 2020 playoffs in the bubble, uh, I don't doubt it. I think people misunderstand about Rudy Gobert because they're so infatuated with this idea that your big man is supposed to be this dominant scorer, at least, you know, and then not playmaker because there's only one big playmaker, and that's Yoke, obviously, but a dominant interior scorer. Well, Rudy Gobert is so good defensively. Like, he's right. so good defensively that whatever shortcoming he has offensively, it really doesn't matter. And he is the engine that makes a Utah Jazz elite in the first place. Because, again, the reason you can make it work, because you got Donovan Mitchell and Rudy, but then you surround him with, with Joe Ingles, you surround him with Jordan Clarkson, you surround him with Bogey, you surround him with other shooters on that squad, Royce O'Neal even, it changes the dynamic because you have to account for Rudy. But the, the flaw with Rudy is, is that you can't make him a decision maker. 
And that's what teams have found out that if you make him a decision maker with the ball, that's when he can come into his errors because I've watched him get the ball right in the middle of the key, turn, be too far away from the basket, miss a bunny, or has a turnover having to, you know, because, but again, that's a schematic thing. Like don't put him in a position to where he getting, you know, he's having to do all that stuff. So I think it's possible mm-hmm. to build around Rudy. Um, that was definitely a, uh, uh, out there. I wasn't even thinking about Rudy Gobert, but I understand what you're saying. Yeah. I, th- I mean, people know that I'm a Gobert guy. I'm, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a Rudy Gobert guy, but I honestly think like uh, just, just getting him, elite point of attack defenders even just one to just just to just pick up the ball and then just having elite spacing with that pick and roll ball handler I feel like that's a formula that we've seen work I mean the Jazz are coming off a historic regular season they they had the the seventh best net rating in NBA history Mm -hmm. they were blowing teams out and Mm -hmm. I feel like um a lot of that comes from Gobert's ability to just control the defense I seen there was a stat that I that I went over in my Rudy video the Jazz had the number one three-point defense and rim defense in the NBA with Gobert on the floor. That's because Gobert being such a dominant rim protector allows these weaker defenders to pressure the three-point line and force teams to live in the mid-range. And that's just not efficient basketball in today's era. Yeah. And I feel like, yeah, you can you can build – there's so many different ways to build around uh, Rudy Gobert defensively, but I think offensively, shooting an elite pick-and-roll ball handler, that's an elite offense right there. Yeah, I agree. I agree. I think that's a great pick. Um, I'll say for me, number four is never going to happen because where he is, they don't believe in doing this, but it should be Damian Lillard. You should be able to build a championship team around Damian Lillard if you don't say, let's forego all defense and only give him CJ McCollum and Carmelo Anthony and, you know, Robert Covington and uh, even, uh, uh, you know, with uh, what's the name, man, playing center Nurkic and all that stuff. I don't, I hate, I hate the way they build their teams around Damian Lillard. I think if you gave Dame and switched him in a situation with Philly, you even switched him with what's going on in Utah, like give him an interior presence that makes up for only being six foot two, not being able to be the best perimeter defender at all, man. The dude put up, again, granted, it was Facundo Campazzo and Austin Rivers. So, you know, granted, he had, he put 55 points up and 10 assists in a playoff game. One of the greatest performances ever, and he lost. Mm-hmm. Because no one could play a lick of defense. So don't look at him and say, well, how come he doesn't play defense? Well, again, that's just not his body type. He can't do it. So you should be surrounding him with defensive pieces because his – Again, his offense is going to be so great. Now, it's not going to be Yoke. It's not going to be Steph Curry. And it may not even be James Harden to some degree. But he's going to be an elite offensive player. And I think if you give him defenders on the perimeter to take some of the baggage off of him, honestly, you give him a a Gary Harris even, something like that, I think that would actually change the game and give him a team that would actually really be successful come playoff time. I think it's worth noting um that Damian Lillard in that 55 and 10 game had like a 100% true shooting it was like it was just I mean his ability to just get hot they'll have those stretches can you you repeat that stat please (laughs) 100% I think I don't know if it was exactly 100% true shooting but it was in the high 90s I remember I made I think it was 96.2 or something like that yeah that is that is insane I mean, he just he's he's capable of just getting hot. And then, like, I swear, I did I don't think he was gonna miss. Like, I was watching that game like like this. I was just like, he's not gonna miss. He's not gonna miss. I mean, he was doing fadeaways from 30 feet out back with his back to the basket and banking them. Like, that's unreal. We've never seen anything like that, not even from Steph Curry. I feel like Damian Lord, and what's underrated about him is how he demands two defenders in the pick and roll from over 30 feet out, mm-hmm. which, which creates a four on five, every single possession. Mm-hmm. So putting a, a guy next to him, like Nurk, I think Nurk is a good, good player next to him who can play make out of the pick and roll to mm-hmm. an extent, uh, make the right decision. I feel like, uh, yeah. And I, I love what the Blazers did with adding from subtraction. They took away Cantor and Mello, their two worst defenders. And they added Larry Nance jr. Who's, phenomenal defensively and an athletic lob threat i feel like yeah the blazers can make some noise this year i'm honestly pretty high on them going into next year yeah i i just don't like the core because we know what the core is the core is is dame cj and his nurk well i already know what that's going to lead up to because cj he had one he had one playoff game i think that is actually spectacular that was that game seven performance against the Denver nuggets 
But outside of that, he doesn't have like memorable performances. Even in the game that they lost, CJ stepped out of bounds and is the reason they well, not the reason, one of the reasons they lost that game in that game six. So I, I just I wish that they had a different player at the at the two guard. Honestly, if you gave Damian Lillard like a Drew Holiday, you know, I think that would change the game. A combo guard who can score, a combo guard who can be a facilitator. And again, let him play off ball. Just like you do Steph Curry, let him play off ball. I think it would change the dynamic of the team. I think Nurk is a good fit to some degree, but once again, I I think he needs a little bit more defense than that. You know what I mean? So I think if yeah. well, again, I think if if you if you've ever watched uh the James Harden Clint Capella days, then you realize how mm -hmm. utterly unstoppable that pick and roll threat was. And maybe if you gave Dame a Clint Capella, and like you know what was funny last year when when he got traded to the Atlanta Hawks, people were just kind of like, oh, that would sound like a salary bump dump. That's a bad team. I said, bro, y'all, y'all really don't watch Clint Capella. Like him mm -hmm. with Trey Young is what made that team so unstoppable with having John Collins and Kevin Herter and uh and, De and DeAndre Hunter and Cam Reddish and all these shooters and, and Lou Will, all them shooters around it. That made their ascension to the Eastern Conference Finals last year uh, with the injuries to other teams as well. That made that possible. I think having Clint Capella with him would be really great. I also think having a guy like Clint Capella, not necessarily running the pick and roll, but as more of the vertical spacer, because what Dayton does in the pick and roll is he comes off the screen and the, 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 defense, the defense is just pulled out. Like, like, cause you're not going to let Damian Lord pull up from 30 feet. You're just not going to let that happen. So when you're pulling the defender, the defenders out, having someone that you can just quickly flick the ball to and, and, and attack a four on five. I mean, I would love to see Damian Lord next to Draymond Green. But, mm. like, obviously, that's Curry's guy, mm -hmm. you know? Someone like the Draymond Green mold, someone who can who can uh, seamlessly fit into that um, attacking four-on-five role and, and going downhill that can also score. I mean, I don't think – I don't necessarily think Ben Simmons can do it to the extent of Draymond because I don't think he's as – That would be fun to watch, though, bro. But exactly. Having Damian Lord and Ben Simmons in the pick and roll, I think – just having Ben Simmons working downhill like that in a four on five situation with shooters around him. I think that's where he would be maximized having a guy like that, creating those advantages for him. That literally just made me excited. Just to think about a Ben <laughs> Simmons, Damian Lillard pick and roll. All right. So you know what? We're going to, we're going to have to do this. We're going to actually make this episode all about this part. Cause we already got so much content and I know y'all are enjoying listening to this, but we're gonna have to do a part two with the up and coming players. Cause we already have an hour's worth of content, but this is great. So tell me, your your fifth player that you would like to build a team around i i want to say this real quick a disclaimer i wouldn't necessarily build around rudy gobert over these other guys no nah, you can't you can't qualify it now this is his list everybody hold him to this he can't qualify it. like i'm not i'm not <laughs> if i'm if, if you give me a blank slate i'm not building around rudy yeah. gobert over james harden i just yeah. i just thought it was an interesting i, guy. I get i get yeah, it yeah, yeah. yeah okay because people are going to be like, yes, Rudy Gobert over James Harden? No. Um, but, yeah, my next guy is James Harden. I think uh, we saw it in Houston for years. I mean, it, it, you give him spacers and one pick and roll big, I mean, put the ball in his hands, it works. It just works. I, don't, I think at this point in his career, he's not really a detriment to his team defensively at all. I wouldn't say he's adding anything, but he's around neutral. He treads water, and I think that's all he really has to do for his offensive dominance as an on-ball creator. I think he's the best isolation player ever. I don't think he's the best isolation scorer ever, but his ability to play make out of isolation opportunities as well, I think makes him the best isolation player ever. And that just holds so much value. Isolation ball is just so valuable. And I feel like just giving him guys that space the floor, one dominant pick and roll big. We saw it in 2018, someone who can also – um run the offense when he's off the floor. That was Chris Paul. They were staggering minutes very well. And I feel like, uh, yeah, just having someone who can run the – tread water on offense while he's off the floor and then just having spacers and one dominant pick and roll big, I think that's the formula. That's the James Harden championship recipe right there. Look, I mean, let's let's be real. They should have, could have won one. They were a Chris Paul hamstring injury away for beating that Warriors team up 3-1, and then they would have went and maybe won that playoffs against LeBron James and them and, and won in the final. So – Again, you know, I think James Harden is spectacular. I, I'm trying to think, does what's his most memorable playoff performance? And I don't, and I, I don't, I'm, I'm not saying that that he he doesn't play well. I think that also speaks to the issue, right? Like, I think when I think of playoff performances, I'm thinking like the Spurs series in 2012 when he went off and actually exceeded expectations. Yeah. You know, 
But really, since then, I can't say I've ever seen James Harden. Like, I don't have a, a, a Damian Lillard moment for James Harden. I don't have a Steph Curry moment for James Harden. I don't have a Jokic. I don't have a Jamal Murray, you know, bubble run for James Harden. Again, not saying he's not averaging good numbers, but I think when his team has needed him to get over that hump, I'm having difficulty coming up with what series it was. But I think that also speaks to if you give him an elite perimeter guard, similar to what Kevin Durant is, you give him a Clint Capella, I think that's perfect. Again, he's the same thing as Kevin Durant. You don't need three great elite players around you, but you give him Chris Paul, you give him Clint Capella, you give him PJ Tucker. I mean, you give him an Eddie House, you know what I mean? Like, or somebody else, Joe Harris at the three, just to space the court and make that pick and roll so dangerous. Let him bring his numbers down from 36 points per game to 31 to 29 with 11 assists. I mean, I, I just think James Harden is just such a, a great player. I think that if his three-point ball was able to stay at pace in the playoffs, I think genuinely he might be one of the four most unstoppable players in the playoffs because he is, has been an average, an average on defense. But on top of that, you have to deal with him every possession when he has the ball. Now that's passing, that's floaters, that's the mid-range, that's the free throws, that's the three-pointer. I mean, literally he can do anything. So I think that if he continues to have teams built like he has with the nets around him, I think that's that's going to help him. I think it just really is going to be health and then elite clutch performances. I also um, wanted to mention, I've been watching the 2015 Rockets more recently, and James Harden has a lot of off-ball potential that just never got untapped because of Mike D'Antoni, which he's at his best with the ball in his hands. But using him as a guy that's like coming off pin downs and playmaking out of those, I mean, he's just, he's so versatile. He can just do it all. I feel like people uh, really underrate James Harden because of that injured playoff series against the Bucks. I mean, I, it's the Celtics, but his numbers in that series were something we've never seen. He, he, he was averaging, I don't remember off the top, I think it was like 27-11 on 75% true shooting over an entire series. Like, that's just something we've never seen. He's, he's a talent that we just have never seen. Mm -hmm. And I feel like people really underrate his ability to just do it all on the offensive end. Yeah. It's funny, you know, we, we praise Damian Lillard for having a 55 and 10 game when James Harden has several of those mm -hmm. in his career, you know? So again, that, I think that also explains why he's such a dominant player. So let me say my fifth player, before we get to the dark horse, fifth player that I would say is Luka Doncic. And I think this is probably harder than people realize because the Rick Carlisle system has made him one of the highest usage players in the NBA. It's in the 40%. If I'm not wrong, I can't, you know, you might know a little bit better than me. I think it's in the 40% somewhere. That's too much. It's just simply too mm -hmm. much. I, I think if you gave him again, he doesn't need Kyrie Irving, but if you were to gave him this Chris Paul at 35, 36 years old, if you gave him something to where he could have, I mean, even maybe a Kimba Walker, you know, again, defensively, there's some issues there because Luka is a negative defender right now at this point in his career. But give him something. And again, maybe this is just me, a Drew Holiday fan, but Drew Holiday would have fit with the Nuggets. He would have fit with uh, Dallas. He would have fit with Portland. He is just one of those kind of players. I think if he had a Drew Holiday, a combo guard who can be an elite perimeter defender, who can take the ball out of his hands, make decisions with the ball, good decisions with the ball, let him work more off ball. And then let him work with, again, I think it's fine having Maxi Kleber with them, uh, you know, having some pick and roll folks. I don't think you need Christoph Porzingis in order to make Luka Doncic work. So maybe even subbing him out. If he had a, if Luka Doncic had like John Collins even at the four, that might make things work for him. I don't know. I don't know what you think about that. I love that. I love that. I mean, a guy that I just love John Collins, a dual threat in pick and roll, pick and pop situations. Like, oh, you can't let him get on the roll. He's one of the best lob catchers this league's ever seen. But also you can't let him pop because he's a 40% three-point shooter. I feel like that next to Luca, who's just – Luca's one of the best decision makers we've ever seen already. Mm -hmm. I feel like, um, yeah, definitely. And I also like how you mentioned Luca needs to be taken off the ball more. Not necessarily as like a catch-and-shoot guy. He's not going to be yeah. curling around screens. Yeah. But like just getting these guys involved, I feel like a lot of people think off-ball is just like, like what Curry and Clay do, running around yeah. shooting threes. But like no, just just – have him come off a screen and, and play make from the elbow. Just, just make it more versatile to where the defense can't really predict what's going to happen. Yeah. I think that's, that's something that people overlook with, yeah. uh, I think, I think having a guy that could even like Malcolm Brogdon next to Luca, oh. I would love that. I would yeah. love that. 
Obviously, yeah. like you said, there's defensive concerns there. But even like I honestly think just just anyone who can just tread water defensively and just take Luca off the ball a bit while also not needing the ball, mm-hmm. I think um would work wonders for that Mavericks offense. I mean, 2020, they had one of the best offenses in NBA history. Yeah. And that was that was uh, I mean, having Seth Curry next to Luca. Yeah. I think, yeah, no, definitely. Um you can definitely build it. The, yeah, I even thinking, you know, uh, having Finley next to him, that's that's you know, Finley Smith is a good player around Luca. Tim Hardaway is a great player around Luca. Same with Jalen Brunson. I love Jalen Brunson too. Jalen Brunson's a great six man coming off the bench. He's elite. Uh, again, I just I, I think that the Malcolm Brogdon point, what I have said this repeatedly. I don't know why people aren't listening to me. I don't know why NBA teams aren't listening. If you have a chance to get Malcolm Brogdon, people will think like, oh well, he's just not like an elite player. Okay, but you're getting a six foot four two-way player who again he might be a b minus on offense but he's a b plus on defense and he's consistent he's consistent so you put that kind of a player around to be a a secondary ball handler or to be a you know full-time perimeter stopper again he's not going to lock down everybody but he's going to make it way more difficult for you than if you didn't have him so i think he would be great and i i just love how how brogdon is just so um versatile in the fact that he's on and off the ball adding the same level of value that's something that he, he he's a playmaker he's an offensive initiator but also he allows the bonus to do and to see what he does while not taking right. anything away from him and not having his game limited i think right. uh, a guy like that next to luca is perfect yeah. also i think it's worth mentioning another guy i think fred van vliet would work oh. next to luca well very well next to Luca. Fred Van Vliet would be amazing next to Luca. Oh my gosh. Toronto Raptors fans, you have two mentions today. Look, Fred Van Wait till we get into the players that are taking the lead. We'll, we'll have a third one. I uh, know we'll have to do that. We're gonna we're gonna go we're gonna that's when we get to the next the next episode, man. But you know, Fred Van it, the only reason people don't watch him because he's in Toronto, but Fred is dirty. Dirty. He would be great, great next to Luca. So, all right, for the last several minutes. Who is your dark horse? So a dark horse player you would build an NBA championship around? Well, definitely Rudy Gobert is, is definitely a dark horse, I would say. Yeah, yeah. Um, he's definitely a dark horse. I think it's worth mentioning that uh, I probably should have saved Gobert for the dark horse and then used Kawhi Leonard. But uh, because I feel That's like there's going to be there's gonna be some Kawhi fans that are like, no mention of Kawhi Leonard. But uh, another dark horse, interesting. I think um, Jason Tatum, I think, is a good one. I think, I think he... We'll talk about it later. I think he's prone to that leap, and I feel like uh, that leap, I mean, putting a guy like Al Horford next to him. I love Al Horford. Someone who can unlock Tatum's game a bit by taking some of the playmaking burden off him because Tatum's a phenomenal scorer. He can pretty much do it all as a scorer. Um, It's about shot selection and things like that, decision-making that I think will make his efficiency a lot better. But um, Why are they starting Al Horford next to Robert Williams? I I really hope they don't. That's that's my only thing. I don't. I don't. I don't think they'll do that. I don't think they'll do that. I I think. I think they're just experimenting right now. I think Tatum at the four is is where he's best because even defensively, I think Tatum's a clear all defense level guy. I think he's a very underrated defender. Now, I think definitely. I think he should have been all defense in 2020. So one of the top ten defenders in the in the NBA Er, to his position, like like because I don't think like. He's better than like I think there's like five centers better defensively than him, probably more. Okay. But like just relative to his position, I think he should yeah. be in contention, especially in 2020. I think last year the COVID thing kind of messed up his defense a bit. Yeah. yeah. And I think he'll get back to that this year. But I mean, he's at his best defensively when he's when he's roaming off the ball as like a help side, weak side coverage guy. Um, he adds value as a as a as a secondary rim protector, I think. And uh he's good in lanes and things like that. I think at the four, that's what you want. Obviously, he's not Giannis defensively, but he plays a similar defensive role, I think, yeah. um, in where he's at his best. And I think him being the, the outside shooter he is at the four is demanding a lot of floor spacing things, too. Um, you're opening up the floor a lot more for guys like Dennis Schroeder and Al Horford to run their pick and roll, yeah. um, things like that. And then, of course, his off-ball talent. I think last year, it, with the Kemba injury and things like that, he was forced to be the playmaker, which just mm-hmm. isn't his role. I mm-hmm. think he's kind of like Kevin Durant in that way. Mm-hmm. You want someone hitting him in his spots mm-hmm. uh, in the post, in the mid range, working him off the ball. And I think uh, you can definitely build a championship team around Tatum. And I think the Celtics have a pretty good um, foundation for that. I think they're clearly lacking talent. They can't compete with the best teams right now, 
but like just the overall um, construction, I think is pretty decent next to Tatum for sure. Yeah. I think their main core should be Marcus Smart, Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, and probably Robert Williams. If I was overseeing that team, I think that also means that you need a little bit better than, you know, uh, Dennis Schroeder to kind of fill in that, that fifth spot in that rotation. Um, so I think there's a way you can build it around Jason Tatum. I think Jason Tatum right now is a B plus a minus level player uh, in, con- you know, in consideration where everybody else is. I think that Jalen Brown's probably around a B to a B plus player. He can average like 26 points per game or 24 or something like that last year. So he's a great player. They're both great two way players. You know, it, I think they're young. I, see, I don't know if Jason Tatum is a part of that or will ever be a part of that upper five level players in the NBA, but I think he can always slot between six and 11. I think that's where his peak looks like it can be. I don't know if he has that, that, that differential thing, like a LeBron or like a Jokic or like a KD or like a Steph, or even, you know, even to some degree peak two way Kawhi. I don't, I don't know if he has that, but I definitely think that he has a bridge where he can get into that, that elite Jimmy Butler effectiveness level. You know, I really like Tatum game. I do think Tatum has potential. I think he has potential to be uh, a top five player. I'll talk about that a little bit. I think um, we saw when he was forced to be a playmaker, I think clearly he has some flaws like decision-making and and overall delivery angles and things like that. But we saw him, it's rare for a player of his age to be using cross court passes like that, covering cross court yeah. things. I talked about it in my Tatum video. He, he he'll be working on like one wing and he'll he'll hit guys in the corner. It's not always accurate. It might yeah. be a touch late, but um, that's foundation for a strong playmaking jump. Opening up that playmaking will also unlock his scoring. Yeah, it'll it'll, it'll make him a better decision maker. He won't receive as much defensive attention if he's yeah. reading double teams better. And I think um, just maintaining his level of value defensively. I think there's a scenario where Tatum is um, a top five player personally. You know what? I think that, so we can get to that again. You know, we have to get to that next, that next video. Uh, I think my last dark horse for our last couple of minutes, Zion Williamson. I health is always going to be the thing. He has another issue with his foot. You know, he's had issues with his knee. You know, I, I don't know long-term viability for him, but I think for you to average 27 and six, to average 20 points in the paint, as a 20 year old or 21 year old, I mean, that spacing too. Yeah. That's what I'm saying. Like give, if, if you gave Zion, like I'm trying to even think, man, if you were to put Zion on like a, give him like a Shea Gilgis Alexander kind of player at the perimeter who can play defense. Uh, he's not a great defender at all. Uh, I don't know what his defensive ceiling is. Cause he doesn't seem to have the, you know, Draymond green is similar height as him. Draymond's not near as powerful as effective on offense or the offensive player. But I think from an a, a IQ standpoint, Draymond is just at a different level than most people, but especially Zion. Maybe he Pretty can Pretty much learn. anyone, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. So that's not, that's not fair to Zion. So, I mean, Draymond's one of the smartest defenders of all mm-hmm. time. But I think Zion needs a, uh, a, derim- a perimeter defensive linchpin to assist him and really needs an interior backside defender, maybe even like what Jaron Jackson could have been at at his height. is kind of what I would think, like I would like at the five, I don't want somebody that's clogging the paint. Maybe Valanciunas can help that a little bit. He has a little bit of a perimeter game, but I think if he had like a Jaron Jackson with the Zion, I, you know, you could keep Brandon Ingram in there somewhere. And then, you know, you give him a great perimeter two-way player, like a Shea Gilgis. Like to me, if I could build a, a Shea Gilgis, at their prime at 25 years old, Zion at 25, Jaron Jackson at 25, 26. I think that's a nice little core for him. I just want to just burn the image of Jokic and Zion together in your head real quick. No, um, I don't. I, I, I it's, <laughs> it's never going. They, the NBA would literally burn <laughs> that trade. They would never. Can you imagine Zion running around Jokic in the mid post, bro, <laughs> just catching a lot. Oh, my gosh. Because, you know, that's the thing. Jokic can play on the perimeter the entire game and wouldn't care whatsoever right. and so you would have no center to do no i see you already got me going there's no way <laughs> there's no way that's the thing like if you gave you know if you had the trade and say you know jamal murray and michael porter jr at a, at a at a max contract for zion at a max contract i mean really it's, it's you could trade whichever one it's going to work simply yeah, because Jokic can make that I work. Mean, yeah i also think uh on, on the topic of building around zion and you were talking about fives that would be um good i think miles turner's worth mentioning there 
Yeah. Miles Turner, I mean, one of the best rim protectors in the league who can also shoot the deep ball effectively. I think he, he's not the best offensive player. He's probably still a slight negative, I would say. But when you put him next to a guy like Zion, I yeah. mean, he's not, he, all you really need him to do is just, is just stand outside and just yeah. let Zion, give Zion space to operate. And uh, Zion's ability to, again, like, like I mentioned with Brogdon, play on and off the ball just, yeah. as, just as effectively. I mean, he could be used as a role man, but also an isolation, like Chris Bosh, mid face-up type of guy. Um, obviously, he's not going to yeah. pull up for a mid-range. But like just getting him the ball in those mid face ups, like we saw with Toronto. But that's the thing; it's it's almost like it doesn't matter if he can shoot a mid range because all all he does is is takes one hard dribble to the basket, and what are you gonna do about it? Right, like there's no one there's no one big enough to guard him. That's also quick enough laterally to keep up with him. I mean. I think Draymond Green would probably be the best mold for like a defender for Zion. I think Aaron Gordon. Aaron Gordon showed a little bit of that last year when they played against each other. He not, again, not not stopping him, but made it more difficult. Yeah, for him. it has to be. It just has to be an athletic forward who can somewhat counter his strength a bit. But like that's rare. That's yeah. so rare. I mean, he's so strong and so explosive. I mean, just that first step. And and also, I think he's one of the most underrated ball handlers too. He doesn't. He's not just powering through people; like he's shifty. He's, yeah, yeah. He's got a nice handle, and he's he's already got such a like nice array of moves going downhill yeah. at this point in his career already. It's so funny I, because like it he's he's not tall enough to where you, when sometimes when he goes to the basket, it still catches me off guard how quickly he gets up on you and how strong he is because he'll take he'll he'll be on the perimeter. He'll do his little jab step. It can be right or left. It doesn't matter two dribbles and it's it's over like but if as soon as he gets lateral with you it's a wrap because there's nothing you can do about him getting up and get to the basket and it doesn't matter who's in the paint either exactly and i i think that's the difference between him and Giannis uh, as like an offensive ceiling he's not looking to go from the perimeter get his running start and like get through that's why the wall kind of works against Giannis. Mm -hmm. zion will start down there battle for position catch it on like the block and just spin past you like like a, a like just, I mean, he's so quick and agile and he's, but he's also so powerful yeah. that it's like, it almost reminds me of like a smaller Shaq. Like yeah. Shaq, Shaq was very agile with his spins and things like that, that people mm -hmm. think he was just all power. I think it's like that with Zion too. I mean, yeah. he'll take you off the bounce. He'll, he'll work off the ball to battle for position yeah. with, with seven footers. And, and it's also worth noting that he, whenever he does miss, he cleans up his own misses and finishes them again. Yeah. I think, that's something that that people don't understand. I, I there's a stat that if you count those opportunities where he misses his own shot and then follows up with it on the second chance, uh, he shoots over seventy five percent inside the paint. Sheesh! On that level of volume, that's something we haven't seen since mm -hmm. Shaq. It's mm -hmm. just yeah, it's it's crazy, man. Yeah, I think Zion is a good option. I think yeah. barring injuries yeah. is like sky's the limit for him for sure. Yeah. So, y'all, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. I mean, you already see you got over an hour of content with this. Again, you obviously can tell who knows his stuff. He's absolutely one of the most knowledgeable people you can find on YouTube. Please, please, please go subscribe to his channel. Let him know, you know, this. you love his content. Go watch his videos, share his videos, grow his platform. Let's continue to invest in people that are actually, that know the game, that are investing in the time and quality and putting out great content. So, who this is a great episode. We're going to have to come back for the second part to come back with the up and comers. But look, this is great, you all. Hey, we will see you all soon.